Welcome to The Rundown. I'm Casey Maldonado. With finals quickly approaching, the stress of everything being due consumes most students' minds. Ali Paul Hemis has the latest on how students deal with stress and what the library is offering to help. As this semester comes to an end and finals approach, many students are dealing with stress and anxiety that comes with projects and exams. Here's how a few students deal with their finals stress. I think that overall, working with your professors is really helpful. Also, finding a way to make studying fun is really important because studying for finals is never fun. What I do too with the stress of finals is I drink a lot of water. I also have a lot of coffee. I try to balance them out because I don't want to be on that coffee high. I get a lot of sleep. Um, I hang out with uh, my friends and my roommates a lot. Um, even though we all have finals, we try to make time for each other, especially this weekend coming up. We're making time to go to each other's performances and hang out and see everyone. If none of those students' helpful tips work, you can also visit the website for more library, where they have a finals week guide to dealing with stress. They have links to let you deal with stress through creating art, virtual pet therapy with videos and pictures of librarians' pets, self-care bingo to help you do things that will give your mind a break, free games to play online, and if you need to talk to someone or need professional help, they have links to writers' support services. Good luck, Bronx, on this finals week. Make sure to study, but also take time for you and your mental health. I'm Ali Palhimas for The Rundown. To look at what the library offers for tips and tricks to de-stress, visit the university's library website under Guides. Field reporter Danielle Tyson had the opportunity to talk to Steve Mark at the Academic Success Center to talk about good study habits and how to be successful and less stressed during finals. With the semester coming to an end and finals approaching, students like you and me are stressed out. I got the opportunity to speak to Steve Marks, coordinator of mathematics tutoring at the Academic Center, about some studying tips and ways to de-stress. Don't wait to the last minute to study for something. Plan ahead. You know when your final exam is going to be at the beginning of the semester. So make a plan of how you're going to study and when you're going to study, put time aside. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me. And also form a study group with the people that are in your class. They're going to be the, the best resource you have outside of the classroom. Our, our major resource at the Academic Success Center is the tutoring that's available. Um, you know, our tutors are um, given the opportunity to, to tutor during finals week, but it's not mandatory, but a lot of them do. Um, so I'd say definitely take advantage of the tutoring that's available. We also have um, a, our success coach, Liz Saputer, who will help, could help with time management of when to study for what final, um, when to study for certain finals, when to um, reach out for help before it's too late, things like that. So we have many different resources at the Academic Success Center that can help with all of the aspects of finals, final exams. Don't overwhelm yourself. Um, there's, there's a thing called studying too much, where um, if you spend um, like 20 hours a week studying for one class, um, you end up getting more confused because you're looking at way too much material that your brain can handle. So make sure you take breaks in between studying um, for your brain to kind of recharge. For more information, visit the Academic Success Center and good luck on your finals. This past week, MGC and MPHC organizations hosted their annual probate to showcase their new members to the student body. I was able to attend the event and get the story. Let's take a look. The National Panhellenic Council, MPHC, and Multicultural Greek Council, MGC, had their annual probate and yard show this past week. The MPHC Council represents the nine historically black fraternities and sororities across campuses nationwide. The MGC Council refers to the National Latino Fraternities and Sororities on campus. Each semester, these councils host their annual probate that showcase their new members for that semester. Alumni and spectators are encouraged to come out and show support for the new brothers and sisters of each organization. During the probate, fraternity men show their brotherhood through stepping and strolling, showcasing a display of unity between brothers. Sorority women in the organizations also participate in stepping and strolling to showcase new members. The probate provides the opportunity for MPHC and MGC organizations to show off their chapter and new members to the student body. Those who cannot attend the probates, which took place at night, had another opportunity to watch Greek organizations at the yard show that took place last Friday. 
MPHC and MGC organizations locally and at Ryder attended the event as a wrap-up for the spring 22 semester. Be sure to follow each council on Instagram to stay up to date with future events. The NFL draft is finally upon us. Alex Schwab has more on who will go on first overall. The 2022 NFL draft is finally upon us. And one year after the Jacksonville Jaguars took quarterback Trevor Lawrence first overall, they'll be looking to make another NFL hopeful's dreams come true Thursday night. Unlike previous years, however, the number one overall pick seems to be up in the air. But Georgia defensive lineman Trayvon Walker is starting to peek his head out as the obvious number one pick for Jacksonville. After an abysmal season, they will be looking to improve their defense with the number one defensive player in this entire class who helped lead the Georgia Bulldogs to their first national championship win in over 40 years. The Detroit Lions will be picking number two, and after a similarly terrible season, they'll be looking to add some bright spots to a generally young roster. Michigan defensive end Aiden Hutchinson had an impressive season setting Michigan's single-season sack record. Hutchinson would love to continue his production in the state of Michigan, but this time, in a different shade of blue. Other contenders for the top pick include Cincinnati defensive back Sauce Garner, who has one of the best names and athletic profiles for any player in this draft. Also, Oregon defensive end Kayvon Thibodeau, who has been sliding down draft boards the past few months, was at one point the projected number one overall pick, so many will be looking to see where he ends up come draft night. The Jags will be on the clock Thursday night at 8 p.m. to make their selection. For the rundown, this has been Alex Schwab. The 2022 NFL Draft just took place this past weekend, April 28th to April 30th, that saw all 32 teams take a multitude of players from colleges and universities all over the country. While the draft has usually been held at Radio City Music Hall in New York City, the NFL has introduced this annual gathering of young athletes and fans to cities like Philadelphia, Cleveland, and this year, beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. The draft order of teams is selected based off of the record that a team had from the previous season, meaning the worst team in the league has the number one pick and the Super Bowl champions have the 32nd pick. This draft season, the Jacksonville Jaguars held the number one overall pick for the second year in a row and made their selection on Georgia defensive end Travon Walker. There were reports swirling that Michigan defensive end Aiden Hutchinson would be the number one overall pick, but he fell to number two being picked by his hometown team, the Detroit Lions. The Houston Texans had the third overall pick and selected LSU defensive back Derek Stingley Jr., a surprising pick due to the fact that he has not played football since 2019, sitting out of the 2020 COVID season and having his 2021 season derailed by injuries. The fourth overall pick for the New York Jets was defensive back Sauce Gardner out of the University of Cincinnati, and the New York Giants rounded out the top five, selecting Oregon defensive end Kayvon Thibodeau. The Jets and Giants were easily the winners of this year's draft, with the Jets having three first-round selections, including Gardner, Ohio State wide receiver Garrett Wilson, and Florida State defensive end Jermaine Johnson. The Giants had another first-round pick to add to Thibodeau, selecting Alabama offensive lineman Evan Neal. The Philadelphia Eagles are also considered to be winners of this draft season, selecting Georgia defensive lineman Jordan Davis, who is 6'6 and well over 300 pounds, as well as adding his teammate linebacker Nicobe Dean, who many draft analysts pegged as a top 15 selection but ended up getting selected in the third round. They also traded one of their draft picks to acquire Tennessee Titans wide receiver A.J. Brown, who is considered a top 10 wide receiver in the entire NFL. The biggest loser from this draft has to be the Seattle Seahawks. After trading future Hall of Famer quarterback Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos this offseason, the Seahawks had a need at quarterback, which they did not address, meaning they will have Geno Smith and Drew Locke duck it out for the starting job. It's not just the teams and incoming collegiate athletes that have the time of their lives at the draft. The NFL also allows celebrities and Make-A-Wish recipients to announce the draft selection in front of millions of fans, including this touching moment of New York Giants superfan Sam Price announcing the Giants selection of Thibodeau. Many lives were changed this past weekend that impacted NFL organizations, incoming draftees, and fans across the country, which is what makes the NFL draft so, so special. With the rundown, I'm Zach Helfer. The semester is coming to an end, which means the championships have just begun. The track and field MAC championships are being held this weekend at the Michael P. Brady track. Reporter Allie Riches has a story. It's finally here. The outdoor track and field championships are this weekend. For the first time in history, Ryder will be hosting the MAC championships two years in a row. But unfortunately, this will be their last time they will be going up against the Mammoth Hawks. All season, the athletes have trained hard to get ready for this moment, 
and coach Brett Harvey believes his team is ready. From my perspective, we're right on track for where we should be with our training. To be completely honest, the hard work is pretty much done. Like we're not going to get worlds better between now and max, but we can get fresher and we can get more rested. And so a lot of our emphasis now is more on rest, recovery, making sure our kids are 100% able to go out and execute at the best of their abilities when we get to the big meets. And so most of the really hard work to get good, we've done. Brian Murphy, a freshman pole vaulter and sprinter, is excited to get out there and show everyone what he can do, making sure that he's taking the right steps to give it all he got. Uh, staying healthy, that's the biggest thing right now. Um, keeping the shins good. Hands a little beat up, but you know, we're doing good. Um, seeing the trainers getting rehab in. Um, you know, staying in contact with my family, my friends, make sure I'm on a positive mindset for this. Murphy, wanting to make sure that he makes his teammates proud, is also looking forward to making his family proud too as they come to the MAC championships to support him. Having my family come out and see me compete is the biggest thing. Um, you know, they're my number one supporters, so. Then with a smile on my face, watch me get deep, with a smile on my face. With the Ryder Bronx in top shape, they are ready to have their best performances and ready to break more Ryder records. But I think what we count on and what we expect is that it'll be the best meet we have all year. And that's what we always try to gear our training and kind of emotional output towards is that the MAC meet is hopefully the best meet our team has all year. Come show your support for the Ryder Bronx on May 7th and May 8th. You can also show your support for our Rider Bronx by watching the live stream on ESPN Plus or by going to GoBronx.com. The 2022 MAC baseball season is almost reaching its conclusion, and the Ryder Bronx baseball team looks to finish out hot. Currently, they have a 21-19 record with an 8-5 record in conference play. They started the week really well, starting on April 22nd when they would beat Manhattan 6-4, taking Game 2 on April 23rd 11-1, and dropping Game 3 on April 24th 5-7. They would drop a game to Seton Hall before taking one from Penn, finally finishing the week with a loss 3-5 against Monmouth on April 29th. Here is what utility man Jake Barbieri had to say about the importance of of the conference schedule. Exactly right, saying that this is the most important stretch of the season. Um, it seems like all teams in the top half of the conference are going to be playing each other in the next couple weeks. So um, it's just going out there, um, having a plan going into these games, you know, just committing to it, just playing all nine. And, you know, if one game doesn't go our way, we can't just throw away a whole weekend because of it. Um, but, you know, this is a very important stretch, so we got to go out there. We got to – people have to step up. We have to make the big plays, big pitches, get the big hits. Um, you know, that's just going to be what does it for us. And then we have Canisius and Maris at home, which will which will be helpful. We play – we've been playing really well at home. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can, we can win these next couple series and then take a few from St. Pete's and then have a lot of momentum going into conference – to the uh, conference tournament. The Bronx have a very important schedule coming up as they finish the season, starting with finishing the series at Monmouth on April 30th and May 1st, before hosting Marist for three games, Canisius for three games, and then traveling to St. Peter's before the MAC tournament starts on May 25th. The Rundown, this has been Luke Lombardi. With the school year coming to an end, the Ryder Ultimate Frisbee team had their senior night game at the Ben Cohen Field against Arcadia University. Here's Sean Harrington with more on this. One of Ryder's most popular clubs in the Ultimate Frisbee team hosted one of the traditions that many sports teams have at the end of the season by having a celebration of some of their players for senior night at the Ben Cohen Field on April 23rd. The Saturday night exhibition against Arcadia University marked the last time some of these players would put on the purple uniform or even play competitively ever again. The team held a pregame ceremony with friends and family in the stands, recognizing the seven seniors who had been there for either a semester or all of these last four years. Each senior received a goodie bag as a thank you for contributing to the team. But once the festivities were over, the disc was chucked to Arcadia and the game was underway. One of the organizers for this event and current exec board member, Ryan Bowman, shared his thoughts on how the night went. I think senior night went fairly well on Saturday. Um, it was a new tradition that we started this year. Uh, we had five seniors graduate, yeah, five. Um, we had the pep band there. We had a bunch of fan, fans and family come out. 
Uh, we promoted it all over campus. And for our first year, I think we had a really good turnout. And I think we sent the seniors off in a very proper way. From all the practices, road trips, and tournaments over the years, the seniors will always have fond memories of the team and will always make sure to stay in touch as alumni. With seven members of the team moving on to the next chapter in life, there are seven shoes that the team needs to fill for next season to replicate another successful year like the 2021-2022 Frisbee team. This week we have some special guests in the studio. Here's George Walton with our first guest. Hi, my name is George Walton and I'm here with Lenaja Evans from the women's basketball team here at Ryder. We'll be talking about Lenaja's Bronx career and her own clothing brand she created when the NIL deal was put into place. First, I'd like to say thank you for talking to me, taking the time out. And to get right into it, what was it like playing for Coach Milligan in the female Bronx? Um, I could honestly say I had a great time doing it, being here like two years. Um, I would say she's a great coach, real life motivational, keeping me on top of things, like instilling confidence in everyone. Uh, with the team, um, I just like have fun with everybody. Like we mesh well together. We're from like different places, so it was kind of weird at first. But like once the season began, we uh, we just begin to like mesh well. We're like friends forever, and I honestly had a great time playing with everybody. Sounds like a good bond. What was one of your favorite memories with the team? Um, <clears throat> I would say the first year going to the MAC tournament. Um, it was like the COVID year, kinda. So like. Things were different. It wasn't like how they normally said it was, but we made the best of it. Um, we stayed at the Hard Rock Hotel. We uh, always were like, in each other's room. We did each other's hair, played games, like watched the men's basketball games. So that was like my best memory because it was my first time being there, and they made the best of it even with COVID going on. You also have a clothing brand named Legendary Ending. Where did you get the name from? Um, honestly, it's just like my initials, Laneja Evans, so I kind of like just played around with it. Wanted to like have the logo, something that related to me. So over the summer, I just like just started messing around with words and came up with it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to run with that. That's cool. Was this something you always wanted to do or did this just happen because of the NIL deal, which allows these college athletes to get paid from their name, image, and likeness? Um, I would just say it was just something like the NIL deal like did come into play, but it was just something to do like to make money, which is like honestly is what I really want to make money. But then like the the story behind the brand is like to write your own story, like be a legend in anything you do. So it's like I play basketball, I want to be a legend in that. You know, I start this clothing brand, like I want to be the best out here selling. So that's where it kind of just came into play, like make money and then write my own story and be the best. Real motivation. Yeah. And this is the brand right here. You know, you got your hat and your, your sweatshirt. This is shirt. You know, a like shirt. Shorts. You know, you hats. got your legendary ending on it. Yeah. Make sure you go to our website at Legendary Ending Apparel to show support. And that's all that we have for today. Back to, back to the studio. Asia McGill also had a guest in the studio this week. Let's take a look at her interview. Hey everyone, I'm Asia for The Rundown, and today I'm here with Raylan Jones for our segment on small businesses on campus. And today we're going to get a little bit of insight on how she plans to run her business after school. So Raylan, what are your plans after school graduation for your business? So if you guys don't know, I run a clothing brand, um, Inclusive Culture, and basically um, I started in 2020, um, started off doing small things, hats, uh, t-shirts and basically my plans for after college is just going to be to continue that and hopefully uh, get an internship in fashion with another brand that I know of from Jersey City. They're doing pretty well. They've been on Complex Con mm -hmm. and things of like that. So yeah. So what can your consumers look forward to for your next drop? Probably um, some summer gear. Going to get into that. Some shorts, embroidered jean shorts and t-shirts. Are there any unexpected challenges you're considering being that you're not going to have customers ready and available at school? Um, to be honest, not really, just because most of my customers are from like North Jersey. Mm -hmm. So it's not really like a big difference, but I still want to make it accessible everywhere. So my website will still be open and things like that. Okay. And like, what's your overall motivation for your business? Um, I think that I just really love fashion. I love like fabrics and just seeing people put it together. So 
if I could do it my way, which is kind of what I'm doing through my brand and watch people put it together, it's it's pretty dope. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's all for today. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Asia from The Rundown. Luke Lombardi was able to sit down with Carola Pascal to talk about Ryder's top men's and women's athletes for the 2021-2022 school year. Here's Luke's interview. Hi everyone, this is Luke Lombardi with our rundown and I am here with Carl Pascal of the Rider News and he is a sports editor and they recently ran the Men and Women's Athlete of the Year. Um, so to start, why don't you tell me a little bit about that and how you guys started doing that. So basically we came up with the idea um, to do a vote for it kind of off of something how Ryder does it, uh, the athletics program, uh, all the athletics programs here do it. Um, and they choose their men's and women's player. They, they do multiple uh, athletes um, usually for like multiple men and multiple women from across all of their programs. So I kind of ad adapted that idea uh, and we just kind of went from there. So before we get into who won, how did you decide and the other sports editors decide who was going to be representing each sport? So for what we did with that, we kind of wanted to have it be at least somewhat fair where we had... Uh, we didn't just choose like two or three candidates. We wanted to have it so there would be at least one from a bunch of different sports. So obviously you've got men's, women's soccer, men's, women's basketball are, are arguably the two biggest four sports here on campus. Um, and then outside of that, we chose to go with uh, one more. Uh, you, we went with uh, golf uh, for Austin Devereaux. He's had a fantastic year, won a MAC championship this year uh, already. Um, and then we also went with volleyball and we went with baseball and softball as well. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we kind of chose the biggest sports and the ones that are having the best seasons so far. And of the athletes that we did choose, we chose the ones that either won broke records, two won championships, or three had the most impactful moments across the year um, mm -hmm. and played the best throughout the year. So we, that's kind of the way we, choose, mm -hmm. we, we chose them. And so how exactly did the voting work? So what we did is we took uh, the, the five uh, athletes from each, um, like for, for five men and five women, and we put it into a Google Forms. So we originally were going to do it out through just email, um, but we decided to put it in Google Forms because we thought it would get more outreach, uh, which it ended up doing. Um, and we put it in there. I was able to lay everything out with the votes and stuff like that. And then we put it in the paper. Uh, there was a QR code. I made a... Uh, a graphic for it and had a QR code for people to vote and we sent it out uh, in an email uh, in the Rider News email uh, that goes out every Wednesday. Um, it was in there with its own uh, link and everything like that. Plus we promoted it like crazy on social media. Well, who won from each gender? For uh, starting with the women, Lanasia Evans uh, of uh, Rider Women's Basketball won. Um, I don't remember the exact total vote she had off the top of my head. Um, but it was a 20 point, it was a 20, almost a 20 vote lead over second place um, over uh, Jesse Nagaki of, of softball. And for the men, uh, it was Dwight Murray Jr. of Ryder Men's Basketball, uh, who won by six votes over Brendan O'Donnell of baseball. Were you surprised by either of those outcomes? I wasn't surprised that Dwight won. Um, Dwight obviously won the, uh, he pushed the Bronx past, uh, past the quarterfinals in the MAC tournament earlier in March for the first time in 11 years, hit the game winner against Iona, um, which was an incredible moment, and I figured he was probably going to win, although uh, O'Donnell did give him uh, a run for his money for a really long time. Um, and then for the women, I was kind of torn between Lanasia and uh, Tegan Scheinbecker from uh, uh, cross country, from women's cross country because she's had an outstanding year. Um, and so has Jesse Nagaki as well. All three of them have had ridiculous seasons. Um, but I'm not surprised Lanasia won because I know she has a lot of supporters and she had a great year. So I personally was stuck in between her and Tegan, but I'm not surprised Lanasia won and I'm not surprised Dwight won. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of The Rundown. I'm Casey Maldonado. Thanks for tuning in.